Thanks everyone for being here this morning and battling the Boston traffic to get here early for you know, hearing these presentations. It's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to tell you about the work that I'm doing within the Center for Genomic Medicine, really trying to advance the new modality of targeted protein degradation in the context of central nervous system disorders. For us, the challenge that our team is really facing is one to take on um, precision medicine as applied to central nervous system disorders. When we look across a series of disorders, many of which are age-dependent, each of them are driven by a toxic protein which will accumulate and fundamentally drive the disease pathogenesis. These disorders are similar in that they are a misfolded protein, a proteinopathy then, each of which has characteristic regional and nature particular conformations of those proteins as now defined at an atomic level by cryo-electron microscopy. These targets have remained challenging for a number of reasons, including their abundance within the central nervous system, some proteins reaching concentrations of micromolar levels, meaning um, with the stoichiometry of targeting those directly, it's been challenging for antibodies and small molecule therapeutics. It is um, true to say that this is a real challenge for society. The increased burden because of not having disease-modifying therapeutics has meant that the prevalence of these disorders has continued to increase. And it's estimated that by 2015, we'll have approximately 14 to 15 million individuals in the United States alone diagnosed with these disorders. This is a significant impact to individuals, society, and of course, the estimates of over a trillion dollars by 2015 um, really motivates our work. Um, because we don't have disease-modifying therapeutics and we are fundamentally targeting aspects currently of the individual symptoms for these disorders, we really haven't prevented the progression and accumulation uh, of these in individuals. Currently, five FDA-approved therapeutics targeting two small two, uh, targets with, of course, uh, adumanicab, the most recent addition as a biotherapeutic. Our interest then is to really begin to continue to humanize the process of CNS drug discovery, leveraging some advances both in our understanding of the disease pathophysiology, advances in human genetics that allow us now to identify causal mutations for these disorders, and a remarkable development then of positron emission tomography agents enabling the imaging then um, in living patients. For us, the experimental therapeutic approach that allows us really to bring together these technologies is the use of induced pluripotent stem cell technology, enabling us to create a genetically accurate and pathophysiologically relevant cell model system for therapeutic discovery. Here, bringing those pieces together and working in close collaboration with our colleagues within the Center for Genomic Medicine and Department of Neurology uh, at Mass General Hospital, We've used targeted DNA sequencing to identify patients with mutations in the causal genes driving neurodegeneration, in particular MAPT or TAU. Again, leveraging the development of new positron emission tomography imaging agents, such as the one depicted in the center of your slide here, one can now identify individuals while still alive and generate an induced pluripotent stem cell of those to enable the therapeutic discovery. Our particular solution then to the challenge of targeting these proteins driving neurodegeneration has been to take advantage of this um, new modality called targeted protein degradation or PROTAX, first really popularized by the pioneering work of Craig Cruz and colleagues, Jay Bradner and others locally here, which conceptualized the development then of a bifunctional small molecule that can recruit a protein of interest into close proximity with a ubiquitin E3 ligase subsequently allowing that protein to be covalently modified and targeted for degradation by the proteasome system. Really beautifully, that same small molecule, once that protein is irreversibly degraded, can participate in multiple rounds of independent targeting a protein for degradation, turning that small molecule into something that begins to have catalytic properties. This really demonstrates, though, the fundamental principle of proximity and our power once we can control proximity in a cell to control therapeutic outcome. In our first generation molecules, which we developed, we were able to show very nice dose-dependent degradation of pathological conformations of tau, as depicted here by Western blotting and independent ELISA assays. On the basis of these data, then, we set out to um, determine the molecular and under understand the molecular mechanism, here developing a compound that has the same warhead to target tau, the same linker region, but is unable to bind to that ubiquitin E3 ligase and shows no degradation in our cellular systems. 
Excitingly, these compounds were well tolerated in our human neurons. This is an image depicting what our neurons look like. They're quite beautiful. The ability now to study the molecular and cellular mechanisms of pathogenesis of tauopathy is now possible with such systems. This particular slide depicts the reduction of phosphotau, a particular conformation that we believe is important for driving disease pathogenesis. And the fact that we're able to very rapidly and potently reduce the levels of tau burden in these patient-derived models is highly suggestive of a potential therapeutic benefit. One of the key questions for us to address was how much tau we needed to degrade. And for this purpose, we took advantage of a paradigm that we've developed that reveals the selective vulnerability of tau mutation-containing neurons. In this case, we've pre-treated our neurons for a total of eight hours with our degrader compound and subjected them to a cell stressor, here A-beta-142 peptides. This, is, this reduces the viability of only tau mutation-containing neurons and quite remarkably, our exposure to our degrader compound is able to provide the same level of protection as a CRISPR knockout of the same MAPT gene. There, of course, those neurons grow up never having tau, whereas our small molecule treatment is provided just for that 24-hour period. Um, these data then, and this incorporating our inactive control compounds, strongly suggest to us the mechanism of action of these bifunctional degraders and provides, I think, a really important proof of concept then of using targeted protein degradation. To date, every single one of the tau mutation-containing neurons that we've treated, these molecules have been active in, no effect on viability or morphology, and no effect then of just the tau ligand or the cerebron E3 ligase binding component. We can block the effect of these degraders using inhibitors of the ubiquinin E3 ligase itself or by blocking the proteasome-mediated degradation. Um, and I think one of the most exciting observations is that we can compete off these degraders using excess amounts of the tau PET ligand, really closing the loop then between the pathological conformations that that PET ligand sees in vivo in living patients and the conformations of tau that are present in our human neurons. One of the most, um, I think, unexpected observations that we made that actually was predicted by the design of our agents, but we were a little slow to catch on at first, was the notion that these molecules are really specific for the pathological or misfolded forms of tau. That is, based on the warhead that we've developed that is based on the tau PET tracer, we would predict no degradation in healthy controlled neurons. And that's exactly what we've seen so far. Really illustrating the promise of targeted protein degradation as a modality that can exploit the three-dimensional conformational changes of protein misfolding disorders, something that antisense oligonucleotides might struggle with, perhaps most similar then to an antibody-based therapy, but we're able to target intracellular forms of tau, subsequently preventing the release and spreading. To really move these molecules forward, we've been excited to work with our partners here at Mass General Brigham to um, launch at its seed stage here, Proximity Therapeutics. This has involved close collaboration with Jay Knowles, Nelson Medeiros, uh, Rhonda Moore, and uh, Meredith Fisher along with the whole ecosystem that's helped us um, begin to translate these closer to the clinic. Uh, in particular, working with um, Arclight and Mission BioCapital to pull together our initial seed funding. Uh, we're beginning the process then of starting a Series A and would be excited to talk to any of you in the audience. I'll just wrap up here by sharing this. Sort of, um, this is a, a collaboration that's extended across Mass General Hospital to our colleagues at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, along with some amazing support from our uh, philanthropic sources, the Rainwater Foundation and Alzheimer's Association. And with that, I'll end. Thanks very much.